good afternoon. Back again to continue our scientific program. Uh, I will ask uh, chairperson for the second session. We have uh, from uh, Mexico, Professor Javier Serlat. From Uruguay, dear Paula Cortez. From Egypt, we have Professor Nasser Said. Professor Mohammed Al Maadawi. And my dearest friend, Professor Samer Kosayer. Uh, is uh, part Egyptian. Uh, Samer is a very close to all Egyptian surgeons and uh, we considered him uh, as Egyptian too. Uh, now I will leave uh, the mic for uh, Professor Nasser Said to introduce the giant first speaker. Uh, good afternoon, first. within the irrefemoral tract system. We learned that the post-traumatic syndrome and the, sym the symptoms of post-traumatic syndromes are directly associated with these pressures. And we know, and uh, based on this already um, you know, publication in 1986, we know that the higher the venous pressure is, the, the more severe are the clinical symptoms of patients. So typically around 40 mmHg edema, hyperpigmentation and ulceration occur in these patients. So the greater the pressure are, the, uh, the, the worse PTS symptoms are in patients. And this was also confirmed um, not long ago with, uh, from the um, Maastricht group who did an intravenous pressure analysis in patients with thrombotic deep venous obstruction on a treadmill test, when you could see that patients with common femoral vein affected limbs with a common femoral vein non-affected limbs have significant difference in terms of intravenous pressure on a treadmill. And this pressure is the reason why the patients with outflow obstruction are suffering from venous claudication and persistent swelling. And this venous claudication is definitely um, impacting um, you know, quality of life in these patients. This is a very interesting study from 2004, where 39 patients with prior lymphoma DVT were followed up. They were analyzed in terms of their venous claudication situation with a chronic obstruction within the outflow of the iliac vein system. 
and the authors clearly found that there is a significant association with less uh, physical um, well behaved feeling, um, less general health feeling, and also um, this venous communication affected social function. Um, and so clearly, um, based on such studies, I think we need to state that patients with venous claudication have an indication for revascularization of their outflow structure within the idiophermal tract. But I think it's important to discuss about indications. So don't treat the lesion, treat the patient. So symptoms of patients are always, always the first and best indicator to decide if you should treat a patient or not. So clinical severity of disease is definitely one of the main um, pillars where we should base our um, indication revascularization strategy. Of course, this is then followed by findings on non-invasive investigations like CTV, MRV, duplex. And of course, based on that, we need to consider if treatment is possible. Can the patient be standard? Can the patient be revascularized? So we need to answer the questions, is, do we have a sufficient landing zone? Do we have enough inflow to the confrontal vein from the profunder and femoral vein? Or do we need to plan a hybrid case? So do we need to uh, plan for endophobectomy or a fistula? These are very important points which need to be discussed before we start with revascularization. Patients with chronic venous outflow obstruction, as already shown, um, are definitely suffering. And this is a typical case here in a young female patient, 36 year old, two kids with venous claudication. She was told for years, no, you have great collaterals, um, there's, nothing you can, uh, there's, there's nothing what can be done to help you. Um, I think this is definitely something which we should improve uh, in terms of awareness rising that these patients with uh, this chronic outflow obstruction, first of all, have a clear reason for their symptoms. And on the second uh, point, we definitely can um, prevent um, further deterioration in terms of post-traumatic syndrome and help these patients with revascularization. As you, as you can see here on the right side, we implanted a long stent here. In this uh, particular case, we implanted a Venova stent and revascularized the inner femoral outflow tract. But of course, as already mentioned, we have to plan it. The, the case I just showed you was a very easy case, I would say, but we are fully aware of these um, severe inflow problems, uh, cases, like in this young male patient already having two femoral and interfemoral DVTs in the past. And here, it is definitely important to plan how can we improve the inflow to avoid a very early stand region doses. And here you can see there was not very sufficient info from the profunda vein, there was no original femoral vein. Of course, these patients can be treated nowadays with modern technologies, with hybrid techniques, but definitely we have to plan these cases. In this case, we treated um, first with a full endovascular approach. We first opened uh, the profunda vein, as you could see here, I was uh, guided. And with that, we uh, were able to improve the inflow from the profunda way. And then within, within the next step, we were able to open all the obstructions in the iliac tract when we implanted the stand from the profunda up to the IVC and um, yeah, performed a well recognition in this patient. But I think this, uh, this is the case, is something we definitely need to do in a multi disciplinary approach together with vascular surgeons, with endovascular specialists. And here you can see after implanting Venova stents from the profunda vein upwards, um, yeah, you can improve this inflow and you can avoid, of course, also, especially in these patients with severe post-traumatic syndrome, to open the groin and have some uh, kind of great problems like bone healing within the groin after interventions. So this is something I think this can be done in venous centers nowadays, and this gives more hope for patients, especially with these severe stages.
We now have a lot of Venus stand on the market. In Europe, we have at the moment um, all these stands available, as you could see here, including the just CD mark Vesper stand from Vesper. Um, and also in the United States, five dedicated Venus stands are now approved. The Wall stand, of course, the Silver Venus stand, the Medtronic Arbor stand, Michi stand, and the Bonobo stand. So we have a lot of options to treat chronic, acute, uh, outflow obstruction and including also uh, nibble indications. The point is that at the moment we are not able to really compare all these stats. Based on the literature, based on the recent published IDE trials and um, data we have for the stat, it's very, very difficult to really compare um, the efficacy of the individual stand. And this is um, yeah, a slide which could definitely show you that. Here you see the different standard length within the IDE trials. You could see that within the ARPA trial, the standard length was 134 millimeter, and like also in the Virtus trial, was a standard length of 149 millimeter. These two uh, IDE trials were um, yeah, the studies with the longest stand implantation. On the other hand, the vernacular and silver US trial. Um, rather implanted shorter stand, uh, had a shorter stand length in, um, situation. So how should we compare these uh, trials because the prime cadency rate does not differ between the stands. So it's very difficult really to compare apples with apples here and it's getting even more complex as um, these uh, IDE trials use different assessment tools as you can see here to determine the efficacy within these trials. You could see that the ARBOR trial, for example, just analyzed outcome with duplex. On the other hand, the Virtus trial, the Vichy stand trial, used duplex angio and IBIS. And I think IBIS is definitely important to learn about the efficacy and safety of a stand. So what, are, what should we do in the future to plan more studies, sufficient studies actually, and to um, really make it possible to compare these stands in terms of efficacy and safety. And I think this is something we all should align on so that we are able to really define that this stand or that stand is better for this or that indication. So there is not a perfect stand for the whole serving system. I think we are aware of that and this is because of the very individual physical behavior of the stand. Here you see the different physical situation of the stand on this um, on this um, picture here, you can see we have open stands, we have open and woven stands, we have closed stand stands, we have oblique stands. So that means that we need to know about the, the different behavior of the stand, the physical um, situation of the stand, the stands, and I think that is very important because we have different um, yeah, situations within the iliac tract which we are fully aware of. We need to have a high rate of force stand in the common iliac vein, usually caused by an, um, compression syndrome here. A high rate of force is needed. The more distal we are coming, flexibility is needed and also kink resistance. And based on this needs, we should then decide which stand we should implant in which indication. And therefore it's important to know about the physical behavior of the stands. And we are aware that all these stands have a conflicting design attributes. It's always um, yeah, um, a problem between strength and flexibility. It's a compromise between, between strength and flexibility. And this, this means we need to know about crush resistance, which is very important proximal. And we need to know about the flexibility behavior of these stands, especially without the ligament and in the, in the common femoral vein. And if we are not using a high radial force stand with a good crush resistance, we could create significant problems. And this is shown here on this slide, which, uh, which I published with uh, Lord Kapnick um, already three years ago. And this shows clearly if we do not follow an aspect ratio um, you know, theory, to have at the end a very good aspect ratio around 1, maybe 1.5. We definitely take a high risk that caused by low flow, high pressure gradient um, have a retrombosis of the stent. So therefore it's important especially to 
um, implant a high crush resistant stent in the common iliac vein. Otherwise, this stent got crushed and re-thrombosed within days or weeks. And this is something we need to have in mind when we treat patients with chronic overflow obstruction. So therefore, it's always um, a very intensive discussion when we talk about stent patency. We talk about the technical aspect, meaning stent choice in terms of force and flexibility. And definitely, we also need to talk about the flow situation. Do we have sufficient inflow? Do we have sufficient outflow? And definitely, we need to talk about anticoagulation in these patients. So here again, you see the um, individual stents itself, um, how they look like. And you can easily define and see that the, these stents differ in terms of their physical properties. And this is shown here in terms of radial resistor support in this ni a nice study from the German working group. On the left side, we see the big difference between the radial resistor resist force between these stents, like a silver stent or a sinus of liquid stent. A significant difference. So, based on this radial resistor force analysis, I would definitely know which kind of stent I would implant in a, a Maytona syndrome with a high compression force. And therefore, we should definitely choose wisely, otherwise we would definitely risk that the stent crush and uh, we, have, uh, are, we need to face a retrobosis and need to, to do a uh, second intervention in these patients. And here is a typical case example on the left side, a clear, it was clearly wisely chosen to use here um, a dedicated Zenus, a venous stent uh, for uh, high radial force and uh, flexibility situation on the other hand um, <coughs> below the ligament. But on the right side, uh, unfortunately, a long stent was chosen in the metronome point. You see that the stent is crushed and also below the ligament the stent is crushed, so the stent retrombose. And therefore, you can definitely see with this example, it would have been better to use also on the right side um, especially for the proximal part, a high radial force stand, and also for the distal part, a more um, radial force stand with additional uh, flexibility to re-stand in this crush situation of below the ligament. Of course, to prove all the efficacies uh, with what we are discussing here, um, we definitely need prospective data, and we now have a very good or beginning long-term data for all these stents, and we'll just uh, briefly uh, show, show you the recent evidence for these stents. This year, for example, was just published uh, two weeks ago. These are the three-year results from the Venovo Venus stent study for the treatment of iliac and femoral vein obstruction. And what you can see here in um, <coughs> that uh, beside PTS, also, little patients were treated in the vernacular trial, so typical mixed indication situation with a total of 170 patients. And uh, after 36 months, we had a very good outcome for both groups. In the, um, in, for the overall group, we had a um, prime patency rate of 84% for the PTS patient, um, of course, a little bit lower, but for the little patients, close to 90 plus percent. So very good outcome for the Bonobo stand um, in different indications like nibble and PTS. So the Monaco trial um, is definitely a trial which help us to learn how, how these stands um, yeah, behave during long term. Um, and I think um, we will see, see during the recent time and now also for even longer analysis for the kind of these uh, stands. Um, also, Stephen Black recently published a two-year outcome analysis for the VG Venus stand in a very complex cohort of, of, of patients with a chronic um, situation, with liver situations, but especially for the chronic ones, he, 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 he found a real, I think, realistic outcomes in, in terms of primary and secondary patency, and definitely learned that it is not only the stand um, you know, which drives the um, efficacy um, of, of a stand, but definitely also the inflow situation, especially in PTS patients. We aim also to support all this evidence um, for the different stands, and I would like briefly summarize 
the recent data which came from my um, institution and um, we all yeah, we got these um, <coughs> prospective data from the Augsburg registries. And this Augsburg registry now has, has more than 1,000 patients included in, in the prospective way. And what we did is that we, um, for every stand, analyzed the efficacy and safety within this uh, Augsburg registry. And I just want to briefly summarize some of these outcome data. Let's start with the real world results for the Vino Bovina stand. And here's the patency analysis for the Bonobo stand. You can see after 24 months in, in patients with nibble and PTO, post-traumatic obstruction situation, we found a very uh, good outcome in a PTO patient. Uh, we found a uh, two-year pre-primary patency outcome of 96%, in nibble patients 95.5%. I think this is a very good outcome for this stand. You can see here that these patients after the normal being stand implantation improved significantly in terms of RVCSS on the left side from baseline to 24 months. It stayed very stable. So with a very low VCSS on the right, on the right side you see a radar chart which shows you that especially um, pain improved in these um, uh, patients and also venous edema and um, uh, active alteration in patient with a C6 situation improved significantly. What we learned is that, um, yeah, especially below the ligament and in the comparable vein, we probably have a different world. Um, Niels Kubra already published this paper in 2018 where he analyzed the predictors of loss of foreign patency. And he found a very interesting association between uh, the, uh, the uh, between loss of primary patency um, situations um, in terms of number of implanted stents. So the more stents you implant, the higher is the loss of primary patency. But especially stents below the inguinal ligament um, are definitely um, a driving factor which lower primary patency. So therefore, I think we need to discuss a little bit um, about the individual behavior of uh, dedicated venous stents below the ligament. We now have very good options, uh, especially for that sensitive area below the ligament in uh, the external iliac vein and the common femoral vein. And I would like to uh, briefly summarize the existing data for the blue flow venous stent, a dedicated venous stent, which is the only existing bovin 90 node stent on the market. So you can see this uh, stand is a hand-braided mesh stand made of two electro-polished uh, 90 node wires. <coughs> it, is, it has a braiding technique with two wires which, uh, which enable closed loop design. It looks a little bit like the wall stand, but again, it's a 90 node stand. Um, the group from Arnsburg and Zurich recently published this paper where we aim to analyze if this stand may have uh, advantage over laser cut 90 node stand for the sensitive area below the ligament and in the comfortable way. So we included 101 patient in the laser cut 90 node stand and 49 patient with a, with a woven blue flow venous stand. Um, with, uh, and these patients were treated with obstruction below the ligament, so come from a vein obstruction and um, external iliac vein obstruction. And what you can see here that we found a significant difference in terms of prime patency rate in PTS patients with a stents extending into the common femoral vein in terms of what kind of stent was implanted. You see that the laser cut 90 node stent has a, had a significant less prior patency situation um, the, uh, in comparison to the bovin 90 node stent. So 67 versus 86%. I think clearly speaks for both a dedicated um, yeah, woven stand below the ligament. Typical case example here, the patient post-IV drug abuse uh, with a completely destroyed confirmal vein, bad inflow situation from the femoral vein, also from the profunder vein. We were able to uh, recanalize the whole kilofemoral tract with an anti-grade and retrograde um, approach here. We performed an up and over maneuver, um, improved the inflow from the profunda vein, with first wiring into the profunda vein, aggressive ballooning them, uh, as you could see here. And after this uh, blue flow venous stand implantation, we had a very good um, uh, procedural outcome in this patient. 
Um, we uh, performed a second analysis for this group flow um, in the stand and, and its um, efficacy and its safety in patients overall with PTS or uh, nipple um, situations. And here you can see in this recently um, or just published study that we have a very favorable outcome for the stent um, in, in terms of nipple or PTO treatment. So for after 12 months in patients with post traumatic syndrome, we have a prime patency rate of 72.6% in a nipple patients of 91.7%. So very effective stent, not just below the ligament and in the common from the vein, it also shows very good efficacy in um, the bone tract. So in summary, let me conclude, the intervention should be considered in these patients with chronic means outflow uh, obstruction after a thorough diagnosis and investigation. Can the patient be revascularized? This is the most important aspect of the question. I personally believe that we should always combine a conservative treatment approach, meaning anticoagulation therapy, compression therapy, with invasive procedures. We know and learned that stenting should be considered if a patient has a lesion uh, more than 50%, is symptomatic, and symptomatic includes also MIS, venous clonication, or a, live, a quality of life impacting uh, persistent um, uh, swelling of the leg. If the patient has a good inflow and good landing zone, and a wire guide wire can cross the lesion, I don't see any arguments why not to stent this patient. We are seeing a lot of new data, we are awaiting a lot of new data and um, I think as we have now a lot of uh, options in terms of uh, dedicated means then we definitely should um, have, have yeah, or should see all this evidence, we should know about the physical properties of this then and um, with this evidence I think we could definitely treat these patients very well and help them to have a very good long-term patency, especially with patency with uh, post, uh, to, to, to with patient with patency with patients with severe post traumatic syndrome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Leighton, uh, for this great and very comprehensive uh, lectures. Uh, first, I I, I just. To, uh, we will have comment from uh, Professor uh, Siral. I hope I can pronounce his name well. And we'll have some questions from the audience. So uh, at the beginning, we'll start with Professor Siral to uh, give us some comment about this very important issue. Professor Siral. about the being stenting. So I want to know uh, how many times did you decide to use the anticoagulation therapy after to the venous stenting? Thank you. Yeah, this is a very important question. And uh, anticoagulation, especially after stent implantation in post thrombotic patients, is definitely one of the big uh, pillars for patency. I think in the past we were too conservative with the uh, duration of anticoagulation. So nowadays, I personally intend, especially in PTS patients with uh, not very good inflow, to do a long anticoagulation. In the past, we used uh, quite a lot of vitamin K, I think, in, this, in these cases. Um, but I personally believe, based on experience, not, not with evidence proven, uh, also, the neuro, new oral anticoagulation drugs are also very good uh, in these indications like rivaroxaban or apixaban. Thank you very much, really, because this is a big problem because uh, all of uh, you know how many times did you introduce, we need to know what will be the best anticoagulate. In our case, we prefer to use the DOAC, uh, me too. But this is a, a very important question, and we need to work so hard about it. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Good evening. Yes. 
Thank you. Now we can open for like, some questions for uh, Professor Leighton. So uh, please let me start with the first questions. Uh, excuse me, if when you finish your deployment of the stent and uh, at the end of the day you found the undersizing uh, stent put it in, uh, you have any solution immediately to correct this problem? Yeah, unfortunately this is uh, difficult. Um, so therefore I, I advocate to really perform a very good sizing for these stents. If you don't have either the Jovasco ultrasound, then I would recommend to do a lot of angulation to define the correct reference vessel diameter. If this is not uh, possible on the, uh, on the site you treat because everything is destroyed, then I would recommend to do an NGO of the contralateral site to learn a little bit more about uh, reference vessel diameter. On the other hand, oversizing is also an issue. We learned that especially uh, oversizing could be uh, issue for young ladies, not obese patients, um, they are coming back with severe back pain or pain in the groin. So proper sizing is definitely important. Right. This lead me to ask one further question. So how, how much you uh, depend on the IVAS in your deployment of your, the stent? Yeah, in these days now, I definitely do 100% of the cases with intravascular ultrasound to learn more about the current reference vessel diameter, to learn from where to where we should stand, uh, to learn more about the uh, landing zones. Um, and actually, two weeks ago, uh, during the Viva conference, the consensus paper was uh, shown by some colleagues, and um, they definitely advocate for IBIS guided venous intervention. So IBIS is a significant important factor for mechanization. Do you hear me? My, my last questions uh, as regard to the landing zone. If you find yourself, uh, your land, landing zone will be uh, nearby a curved segment or curved segment of your vein, what you are going to do? Mm, I'm not sure I really understood the question. There was an inter interview here. Um, so the landing zone um, should be always just be proximal to the profunda inflow. Um, if the profunda inflow is bad, then we intend to do as a, a preparation step the profunda inflow preparation from the contralateral side or transjugular. Uh, side to create better inflow, but I always tend to land the sand, stand just proximal to the profunda inflow. Right, thanks. Uh, please stay with us because we have many audience have many questions for you. So excuse me for that. So we'll start with Dr. Professor Dr. Magda Hagan. Can you come here? I think it's better. Thank you, Dr. Michael. I wonder if you can, if you have, have any comment on, uh, for a venous system, you transfer volume from the lower limb to the IVC. So it's a volume transfer. It's not a pressure transfer. So does this point affect the patency of the graft? Because at the beginning, we are very happy by our results. Once the limb is already released from the high pressure, we start getting the complication and uh, we need another recanalization session. What do you say about this? So I absolutely agree. So this system is complex because it's a low flow, low pressure system. And if you are undersizing, oversizing, or leaving some obstructions behind, and this leaves a recanalization area, then you definitely will fail. The graft will reocclude, and you need another, another session, uh, session or re recanalization. Um, therefore, it's important uh, to create good inflow. Um, optimal is always from both uh, femorals and profunda. And if this is not possible, profunda. And if this is not possible, uh, you have to plan the case from the beginning on as a hybrid case with endophilobectomy or avifistula. 
Um, and this is totally different to the anterior side. It is a low flow, low pressure system. And we are talking here that, uh, about that uh, um, the profunda needs to feed a large, large uh, iliac vein. Yeah? And if the profunda has not sufficient inflow, this large diameter of the iliac part won't be feed enough and it will reoccur. Therefore, it's so important to assess the inflow and uh, to uh, plan a good inflow if, if there's no one. Okay. One more question from the audience. Um, my, my question that uh, if you have uh, a, a reflux in pelvic circulation, uh, a reflux in pelvic circulation, and at the same time there is an obstruction, does it, uh, uh, what to choose first? To do the obstruction, to treat the obstruction, or the reflux? And does it differ if it is a level problem or a PTS problem? Yeah, that's a good question. We sometimes see patients with, uh, or we could say uh, quite often we see patients with pelvic venous disorders who have an ovarian reflux and a significant outflow <coughs> obstruction. And here it's definitely difficult um, to uh, really assess what is the, the major problem. Is it the reflux, the ovarian reflux, or is it the outflow obstruction? I personally believe that um, the obstruction is the primary factor, but I think it is very individual in these patients. So, uh, whenever uh, I do these cases, I definitely analyze the ovarian veins uh, in terms of reflux and the, the, uh, the methernal point with IVUS and definitely then decide very individually which, which I'm going to treat first, probably the, the alpha or structure first down. Thank you, uh, Professor so, uh, Leighton, for your uh, kind explanation. And thanks, Professor Sirald, for your kind uh, uh, comment. Now we asking for Professor uh, Duganzi back again to give us uh, a very important lecture about recanalization of iliocaval uh, veins. So, uh, Mike, for with you, Doctor Duganzi. Uh, greetings from Turkey, Ankara. Uh, it actually, it was very difficult to talk after Dr. Littenberg with, uh, for he gave a very extensive and perfect uh, presentation about all the issues of deep venous stenting. So I will try to summarize uh, my experience and some uh, scientific data for iliocaudal stenting. Now I'm sharing my presentation. I think you see it right. When we look at the literature, especially for the iliocaval stenting, we have several different IVC confluence configuration, uh, such as the double barrel at position fenestration confluence and skip the lesion. We have some five types of uh, IVC configuration. And each of them has some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, regarding the cable stenting. Especially for the, when we look at the double barrel system, uh, we know that from the literature and from some experimental studies, especially for some type of double barrel stenting, uh, when, we look, when we analyze the animal studies, especially the metallic parts of the stent that touch each other, uh, is not getting that, that much endothelicized and uh, it's not covered by the endothelial cells so that parts are still prone to uh, thrombosis uh, and that's why it's a bit difficult to have uh, let's say such type of configurations for the long-term data and especially for the uh, position <coughs> it, it, at the long term this type of uh, let's say that type of uh, configurations also have a tendency to, to fail because of the pseudo intima endothelization of this stand in the long term. And for the fenestration as well, uh, it can have some resistance in the long term. And as Dr. Lichtenberg explained, uh, the, in the long term especially, the resistance is very important for us because we know that the 
Venus flow always prefer to uh, go through less resistance system. And especially for the confluence part, when we, for example, come from both iliac sites and uh, it's, for example, 16 millimeter stand, and when you put it in a, especially, let's say, 40 millimeter cable stand, then uh, the sizes at the inside the stand becomes, uh, let's say, not oval, uh, and then they, they become the resistance. So uh, all those type of stands uh, configurations can be a problem. But uh, recently we are doing this skip lesion uh, uh, type of IVC configuration, and which we recently published uh, together with my friend Human Jelai and the Ahan group. So according to the <coughs> results of this study, excuse me, <coughs> uh, uh, this uh, leaving a skip lesion between the iliac and cable system is not uh, adversely affecting stent patency. So this can be somehow advantages of this type of stenting. And one of the other issues that I uh, sometimes uh, think about uh, while we stand stenting, if we cover the orifices of renal veins, how does the system is affected? And this is a very good study. So uh, the, this, this study is answering our questions. Then they made a three type of stand configuration. As you see here, they just covered the orifices, they put a Z stand, and they made also a skip lesion at the renal vein orifice. But at the end, they say that stand placements across the renal vein inflow in patients undergoing ileocaval reconstruction it doesn't, uh, let's say, make any difference. So uh, we can uh, do regardless of type of stenting and we can use uh, any type of stenting at the orifice of renal vein. Here is uh, an example of one of my patients. Uh, it's a six, 36 years old female patient and she has a history of deep vein thrombosis in 2001 and she has a venous medication and uh, she has a healed ulcer, as you can see, and huge abdominal and uh, superficial collateral veins. Uh, th this is her uh, CT scan. Uh, and as you see, there are lots of abdominal and collaterals, and here you can see that there is always nothing. And during the uh, stenting, as you see, we don't see any KL segment, or uh, all we see is they are sending lumbar uh, collateral veins. And sometimes it is uh, a bit difficult to cross those lesions. And if you are lucky and if we cross these lesions, especially for the KOL stenting, I always uh, advise to park your wires above the heart because in case of any stent jumping, if your wires are still there, you, are, you have a chance to get back them. So always I advise you to park your wires above the heart. And then uh, we start with small balloons and then you go bigger balloons and as you can see here we made a skip segment uh, stenting here so uh, after post dilatation as well uh, now we, uh, we see that this is a very extensive reconstruction from just above the deep femoral bifurcation to <coughs> nearly till the heart and as you see this is the final uh, photography of this patient and this is another uh, iliocaval patient, 32 years old female, and history of DVT since 2003. And she is a bit obese patient, but these are all uh, patients with severe symptoms. So, as you see, uh, this lady also has a superficial uh, abdominal wall collateral. So, and when we look at this lady, and there we see only the paravertebral collateral and chronic iliocaval occlusion. So we make the reconstruction, and this is the final photography of this lady as well. And this is another patient's a rare indication, maybe a retroperitoneal fibrosis case, a 50 years old female history of uh, 10 years of history of uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis. In the in the meantime, this lady lost her one kidney and both ovaries, and severe uh, leg edema uh, for both sides. Uh, for the last one year, and as you see here, there is huge uh, collateral veins, and we don't see the cava and also the common iliac veins. Unfortunately, for the left side, I couldn't uh, pass through the left side, but I could hardly pass through the right side. And these lesions are really 
uh, difficult lesions to even uh, dilate. Um, finally, I could uh, do this case on the from the right side and the cable side. And as you see here, uh, from the right side to the cable. Uh, and uh, after even one day, uh, her uh, both legs edema disappeared. And now she is nearly approaching to one year and happy without edema, even from the left side. And this is another patient, as you see here, uh, no almost flow, but uh, we made also, as uh, Dr. Lindenberg uh, mentioned, the inflow augmentation from the uh, femoral vein. And we stent this uh, guy as well. And this is the, I think, the, before the stenting. Uh, this is predilatation, and I think this is after stenting. So, uh, yes, this is after stenting. We see the good inflow and uh, outflow for this patient. And this patient uh, was a really problematic because here you see that there is a big uh, un unhealed ulcer. So this was nearly a 10 year uh, ulcer which didn't heal. And this is just uh, after one month and this is after <coughs> six months of stenting. So those patients are really benefit if we do it correctly. And this is an example of patient which I want to show you. We shouldn't do it because uh, if I may uh, stop, I don't know at the uh, correct place, but this is a idiocable disease patient in another center. Uh, they stand this patient uh, just for the idiocs and they did nothing uh, to the uh, cable, so those stands got occluded, unfortunately. Uh, Especially as Dr. Lichtenberg mentioned a lot, this is, uh, this is not the correct way of doing this. Uh, we should learn it very well before doing anything because to recanalize an occluded stent is really harder than doing it for the first time. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for these nice uh, lectures, uh, uh, Professor uh, Duganzi. Now, uh, uh, can I invite uh, Professor Bula to give some comment about this lecture, and then we'll have some questions uh, from the audience. Dr. Bula, do you hear me? She's around. I just so okay, okay. Uh, so we can Dr. Bura you hear me right can sorry okay. right we ask you uh, invite you to thank you for the invitation and so thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to participate an excellent presentation Dr. Dognasi um, I have a question for you uh, regarding the age. If, uh, for you, it's a limitation a woman, young woman who wants to get pregnant. And do you, uh, for the indication of treatment or also the type of uh, stand that you would like to uh, place in a woman who wants to be uh, pregnant, pregnant in the future? Make yeah. a difference? Actually, thank you for this question because especially the second patient that I show you, uh, he, she she was uh, she wasn't cut any babies so far, but after the stenting, uh, he, since they uh, even uh, they, they don't have a baby so far, they are not protecting. And this lady got pregnant uh, after uh, the therapy, and she gave a healthy healthy baby uh, after stenting. And the stents didn't affect it be, uh, during the period, but. I, I have uh, several patients who got uh, pregnant and gave a healthy baby after standing. So I think it, this, this can be a, a topic of uh, investigation because the venous system, uh, especially venous uh, return, get normal after standing. The, let's say, reproductivity, I think, is increasing. Uh, and because even uh, uh, though even I use a wall stand at the moment because the dedicated stand is not reimbursed in Turkey, uh, they are not uh, get 
affected uh, during the pregnancy. As long as you keep the anticoagulation well, they are not affecting. But this is a very good question. Thank you that I hope I answered your questions. But of course, if now the dedicated stands with high radial force, then I think even the wall stand is not affected. They are not affected to, from the pregnancy. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. Thank you, Dr. Bura. You would like to add some comment or let's... Okay, now we can add some questions. One question from Dr. Ayman. Uh, uh, thank you, Swat. Uh, I enjoyed your lecture uh, very much. And uh, of course, uh, talking after Littenberg uh, will be very difficult, as you said, but I have uh, uh, some question. Uh, as we know, uh, venoplasty is totally different from uh, angioplasty or uh, dilatation of the, art uh, the arteries. Uh, as, uh, for example, as you mentioned, you can uh, keep uh, and, uh, a segment without uh, stenting, escape segment, and you are not afraid of uh, uh, troubles in the venous system. Uh, <coughs> uh, Angioplasty of uh, the common iliac arteries is mandatory to be followed by stenting. May I ask you what are the rules for doing stenting of iliac veins when we should stent and when we may not stent iliac veins? Thank you for this question, dear Ayman. This is a very uh, important question because uh, in the venous system, uh, venoplasty is never enough. We always have to uh, stent because uh, these are all fibrotic vessels and they, they have a tendency to recoil. That's why uh, we, we should always stand those lasers. But for the uh, iliocaval system, as I show you, if you leave a small skip segment, this, this is not affected uh, from, uh, let's say, from your standing technique. Because this skip lesion is not that big, so you can keep it keep it like, a, let's say, half centimeter something. So uh, that segment is not uh, have a tendency to recoil because you have all the stands there. But otherwise, especially uh, if you leave longer uh, skip segments, of course, it will be a problem. But uh, especially for the cable part, uh, since you stand above and below, it's not, uh, let's say, recoiling. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question for you, Dr. Duguanzi. Uh, as regard to a case of May Turner syndrome, how far you put your stent uh, up, uh, you go just flush uh, with the IPC, or you have to go in uh, IPC for uh, some distance? Yeah, this is a very good question as well. It depends on what type of stent you are using. If it's a high radial force dedicated stent, you don't you don't need to go that that much into the IVC because the radial force is enough to keep the artery up. But uh, the IVC is very important here because uh, you shouldn't go that much, especially if you are using the let's say wall stand. The tips of the wall stand is very weak, so it is not that strong enough. Uh, so if you leave just a small segment below the artery the artery will crush your wall stand. That watch, that's why you have to go a bit more into the IVC. But if it's a dedicated stand, you don't need to afraid. Especially the new venous stands all have good radial force, so they are able to keep the, the artery up. It is not a problem. And there is no residual compression in the long term. But for the... Uh, all stand, you should always be careful because you have to go inside the cable. Uh, but if you go too much at the long term, uh, especially after two years, when the pseudo intima, uh, let's say, covers the inside the stand, and then you can have a contralateral deep vein thrombosis. So when you look at the Raju's, Dr. Raju's data, 
there is a 10% contributor deep in thrombosis with the wall stent. And then they change their practice and they are now making the uh, Z stand configuration. So it's an open open cell design, uh, let's say with higher radial force. So after the Z stand configuration, their uh, contractor DVT incidences uh, decrease to 1%. But this is a very important issue. Thank you for this explanation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dubianzi and Dr. Bola. Thank you all. Now it is time to invite. Uh, our colleague, the eminent Dr. Mohammed uh, El Maddawi. He will talk us about case presentation uh, uh, subclavian vein stenting. Okay. Uh, before I start, I uh, would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Ayman Fakhri for his uh, generous and uh, stoic efforts. He usually paid uh, for us to exchange our uh, experience with each other. Uh, I, 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 I would like, uh, before I uh, start uh, my, uh, my, my talk, uh, uh, even the audience and our guests, uh, what about uh, uh, consideration for uh, treating endovascularly with possible stenting in a patient who uh, have uh, who are hemophilic, uh, together with the uh, consideration about the new oral anticoagulants with the uh, hemophilic in the hemophilic patient? Uh, can I uh, raise this question to? Uh, to the audience and to uh, the panelists to answer me before I start my talk. Thrombophilic patients, the consideration of putting uh, stent in patient to who are thrombophilic patients. Uh, do you put them into special concentration or you treat them like any other patient uh, uh, you treat? Can I? Uh, yes, please. I, I think uh, the most important uh, in this case uh, the anticoagulation for the. So, uh, the way to, an to anticoagulate this patient post operative. You have to put him on uh, low molecular weight, then uh, warfarin, rather than anything else. Uh, I, uh, as regard to the technique itself, I, I, I don't know if there is a special uh, precaution or techniques in these cases. So you can give us explanation uh, should, for uh, that. Should, should you treat this patient uh, or, or you uh, change to conservative management? Uh, Actually, because this patient is high risk for uh, re-thrombosis or uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I prefer to, to treat him conserved as much as we can, but uh, in a high uh, complicated cases with uh, unhealed ulcer or uh, patient uh, disabling walking or some, so we can try to do something, uh, I think we can. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I want to ask first, did, uh, Professor uh, Hamad, do you mean that uh, the patients that uh, have a post thrombotic syndrome? Or, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Thrombophilic patient. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, think, I think we should offer, should, uh, should offer to this patient uh, the, the treatment as for other patients, but it uh, will differ uh, uh, according to the time for anticoagulation. Maybe other patients, like for uh, uh, needle patients, the non thrombotic patients, we can use a stand, put a stand, and short time anticoagulation. If the, if the patient has a PTS, we can, can extend the time for anticoagulation, but those with the, those thrombophilic patients have to extend the anticoagulation maybe for a uh, lifetime. So we should offer the treatment but the, the anticoagulation will be more. Yes, thank you. 
What I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, different. We are uh, focused on the uh, subclavian uh, vein uh, stenting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, tackle them in two uh, points of view. First is the technical point of view, and the second is the strategic point of view. Uh, usually in our institution, we perform this, those uh, patients uh, under general anesthesia. Uh, because of uh, certain considerations about the procedure is tedious and lengthy and it can take several hours before you can cross a uh, lesion. And also it is uh, painful during the dilatation of the, vein, uh, of the vein because of the tightness of the lesion and its uh, length. It leads to recruitment of more nerve endings that the patient cannot tolerate uh, that uh, pain, uh, unlike the arterial system in which the patient could tolerate the uh, 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 flash pain occurring during balloon dilatation. Also, we usually perform multiple axes. Uh, ظهر كده خلاص Uh, we, we, we usually uh, use multiple, uh, multiple axes uh, because of the uh, uh, different uh, considerations. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, you might uh, come from above and you fail to cross the lesion, but you might be successful if you come uh, from below. Like this patient has two, uh, uh, two axes and potential third one uh, on the uh, left uh, uh, femoral uh, vein. Uh, uh, also, the uh, multiple axes help you uh, uh, to have uh, all the time road map. You, you see from the other side that uh, where you want to go and where is your target lesions that you want to tackle during the process of uh, the uh, crossing of the lesion, which is the most important uh, in, uh, such, uh, uh, in such situation. Uh, also, uh, multiple, multiple uh, 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 crossing about the crossing of uh, of the lesion, uh, as I have uh, said before, you uh, might be successful from coming uh, from above, but you might uh, not uh, fail if you come from uh, the femoral uh, from the femoral artery. This uh, from the femoral vein. This is about the direction, about the uh, tools you use. There are no standard tools for to cross the lesions present in uh, the veins. Uh, you should play the winning card. Uh, you might be successful to cross the lesion uh, even by 0 0.14, uh, and you might need to uh, uh, use a sharp an instrument, uh, like sometime the uh, back of the wire or the, stiff, uh, or the stiff wire. But you should do uh, them with extreme caution. Uh, as regards the breathe dilatation, because of the tightness of the lesion, you need to have uh, 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 high pressure uh, balloons uh, to accomplish your uh, lesion, which are uh, not uh, available every, everywhere. Uh, Sometimes you uh, might have to put two balloons alongside over two wires in order to increase the force of, uh, of each one to be combined and to have the diameter you desire to reach. Like this case, in which two balloons are placed side by side over two wires and inflated simultaneously to accomplish the goal you want to do. <coughs> After the pre-dilatation, you should perform a check uh, angiogram and uh, always the indications to put the stent varies according to the results of the uh, uh, initial PTA. If you have a residual lesion which is equal or uh, above 50% of diameter of uh, the vein, you should consider putting a stent in uh, such a situation. Uh, like that, and this is stent should cover from 
uh, healthy area to a healthy area and should be uh, uh, compliant with the uh, index diameter of the vein you are being treating. Uh, now we come to the uh, strategic points of view. We have an argument about the veins. Veins are not like the arteries. Both are uh, 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 channels to uh, transmit or convey blood away and to the heart, but they behave differently. They have different anatomy, different physiology, different response, response to the uh, barotrauma. And uh, uh, also, they uh, should be considered as a simple entity. What is the common between the arteries and the vein uh, from our view is the uh, way we are uh, uh, treating them, the skills we are applying to cross, for example, a lesion. But we should consider them as uh, two different entities, and we should not translate what we have in our mind about the arteries into the veins. We have some of the unanimous agreements, that there is an agreement that, that I have uh, said, that the stent is indicated whenever the residual stenosis is equal or more than 50%. Uh, this is uh, a, a total agreement between all the physicians, but a lot of points are not settled down, and there is no uniform opinion ag about them. Uh, for example, uh, to perform a stent for every case I have uh, done or to see if the result of the BTA allows for putting this or indicates that to put, uh, to put it. Uh, uh, <coughs> so we have a routine stent versus bail out stent. If I have a, a, a unsatisfactory results, I go for, for the stenting. Or should I put a stent from the start? Uh, the enthusiastic persons to uh, put a stent. Uh, yes, this is uh, 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 last month uh, published uh, uh, review uh, article about comparison between the BTA and putting stents in the patient in the uh, subclavian in the sub in the subclavian vein. It showed that uh, 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 both primary beta and serrates are similar. Uh, to it, uh, uh, sorry, uh, stents are uh, superior to the PTA during the first uh, two years. And after the first two years, there is uh, equal results or equal uh, patency rate after uh, the, first, uh, the first two years. <coughs> to anticoagulate the patient and by which type of anticoagulation should you go or to give to the patient antiplatelets. And if you anticoagulate the patient, would you like to anticoagulate the patient for a short period, like three months, or you should give the patient anticoagulations for, men for more than three months? Actually, there is no uh, conclusive answers for all the questions I have, uh, I have mentioned. <clears throat> the cause behind this inconsistency between the opinions of the, of the physician worldwide comes from absence of uniform terminology uh, because, uh, sorry, lack of uh, reporting leads, uh, lack of reporting leads to this inconsistency. Why there is lack of, uh, of reporting? Because of the absence of the uniform terminolo terminology along the published data. Absence of head-to-head -head randomized control studies, as for example, between uh, to uh, boot primary stent or to do uh, only uh, PTA. A lack of long-term follow-up for, th for that patient. No, uh, no, no follow-up was uh, found among the literature, which is uh, uh, more than uh, five years. The true ideal venous stent has not yet appeared. We have what's called the dedicated stent. Dedicated stent that combines some of the properties that may conform with the veins, like the radial force together with the flexibility. but. The vein is not a, a channel to convey the blood only. It respects a different physiology. It has a different diameter, different shape during the uh, respiratory cycle and during the cardiac cycle. And up to now, there is no uh, such a like, uh, like stent. This is uh, led to the uh, publication uh, by the Society of Interventional Radiology uh, reporting standard for the treatment of the central veins. 
they need to uniform all the terms uh, in the publication, the future publications, to have uh, data uh, useful in uh, deciding about the arguable uh, points I have, uh, I have mentioned. Uh, starting from the definition by the anatomy of the central veins, symptoms of the patient, uh, investigations to be performed, and the way those patients are treated. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Now uh, we invite Dr. Kosay to give a comment about Dr. Mohammed lectures. Good evening, Dr. Kosay. Uh, good evening. I thought I'd be giving comment on the last one. Yes. The you, IBC. I, I, I'm sorry because right. I didn't uh, inform you before. So this is the last talk. Dr. Ahmed Khair is not around, so this is the last talk. I'm sorry to invite you to give a comment suddenly. So, are you ready? Or we can have, because you are a half Egyptian, so we can give you sudden questions. Uh, okay, Dr. Mahat, yeah, Professor Mahat, that was a very nice presentation. I appreciate that, you know. And uh, really well, liberal with a standing morbid angioplasty. For some reason, we had a bad outcome with that uh, angioplasty alone. So any doubt we have, think that patient have residual stenosis, we prefer to stand, you know. Yeah. Um, the only thing I have, two things. Always before we stand, we think about thoracic outlet syndrome. We want to be sure that patient has no thoracic outlet syndrome because sometimes we you know, we don't pay attention patient with the stent fractures. And the second thing, we have increased use of cover stent for some clavian because some papers show the beta C is better with a cover stent than bare stent for some clavian pain. So do you agree with that? And thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Just I, I would like to have a word with you, Dr. Sarah again. I would like to ask you if you have a, a, a Ostian subclavian lesion and segmental as well and this and the patient had a cabbage operation several years ago so how can you manage uh, a challenging case like this uh, provided you can save the internal memory which used uh, in a cabbage okay doctor you hear me uh, I didn't hear. This is for me? Yes, because I would like to uh, have a word with you. <laughs> uh, can you say that again? Can a you repeat that question? A a chal I faced a challenging case uh, several weeks ago. Lady had a cabbage several years and became complaining from uh, each time uh, do exercise with left uh, arm, she feel chest pain. Uh, we done CT angio, we found osteal and segmental subclavian uh, stenosis. So uh, how we can manage this patient uh, provided we need to keep the internal memory patent. Do you have any uh, give? I mean, can uh, give uh, we have a case like that, similar right. to this case. The question is that which is better to do primary standing or do cut subclavian bypass, you know? Uh, we prefer to do primary stenting, but if I do like this case, I do it with the cardiologist uh, because sometimes small embolize or interfere may, you know, close the, 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 the limb and then you end with a major problem. So if I decide to do it, I usually do it with the cath lab with a cardiologist. At least something happened, we are in the cardiac, you know, in the cath lab, not in the angio suite. But the other option to go and do carotid subclavian bypass. Uh, I think sometimes maybe safer than going standing because there's chance of embolizations and yes, it's more invasive, but I think it's safer to be sure that get inf inflow and no embolization to the uh, limb patient has a cabbage. Right, thank you for this explanation. May I ask you to uh, thank all the professors who are with us now and uh, you can close the session, please, Dr. Kossi. Um, thank you for the nice presentation, really was a very nice uh, session. 
was beautiful, it, uh, nice, very challenging uh, subjects, uh, especially about the design of the future stand. Uh, unfortunately, until now, we don't have the optimal stand, the Vila stand, uh, but we are getting closer. Of course, our stand now is much better than a couple of years ago, so this is a good achievement, I think. Uh, for the EOK well, recanalization, I think a lot of technical uh, issues, and it's explained very well in the presentations. Uh, thank you very much for that. And, uh, and as, as you said before, the worst thing is to put a bad stent because recanalization of a good stent is worse than uh, primary uh, recanalization of ilio cable uh, occlusions. So if somebody has to stent, it has to have a good experience for ilio cable uh, reconstructions. And the last one about spirabina cable occlusion, I think the comrade Dow did a very nice uh, presentation with a good uh, extension of his experience. Uh, but again, the only thing I always concern about the first and second I just be sure patient doesn't have a thoracic outlet syndrome. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, uh, thank you all the speakers. Uh, thank you, Lettenberg, uh, Dukansi, and uh, Mohammed Al-Mandawi. Oui. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all uh, panelists. Uh, Charlotte, uh, Bola, Samer, uh, Nasser, and uh, Mohammed. Thank you all. We enjoyed your company. Now uh, we close the session, and uh, I ask uh, the chairperson for the third session to uh, start the session immediately. I ask uh, Professor uh, Magdi Haggag, Professor Ali Murad from Egypt, and uh, let us uh, celebrate and uh, uh, enjoy the company of uh, Professor Atif Salam from United States. Uh, Professor Martin Mersh from Al Bahrain, uh, Professor uh, Hussein Rabia from United Kingdom, and Prozac, uh, Dennis Prozac from Russia. Uh, we'll enjoy your company, and uh, I'll ask uh, the chairperson to start uh, uh, the first, uh, the third session, and uh, uh, start uh, asking the first speaker.